So I'm sure you all know the history of machine translation. I'm not going to spend a long time on it. But essentially, we are in a state of a kind of paradigm shift at the moment. If you think back to the early days of machine translation, uh, the sort of post-Second World War period, the general approach to machine translation was to sort of try and make computers process language the way people do, more or less. So uh, with kind of large dictionaries, vocabularies, uh, with grammar rules. And that was really the state of play for almost 50 years in machine translation. That was sort of the underlying approach where the the computer scientists were really trying to force linguistics onto the computer. And you know, certainly they had their successes, uh, they made progress, but it was not until they decided to radically change the approach to machine translation close to sort of the, in the 1990s to really flip it around and let the computers do what computers are really good at. And computers are good at things like number crunching, they're good at things like pattern matching, and so when we shifted into this kind of what we call corpus-based or data-driven approach to machine translation, we saw quite a, a sort of steep incline in the progress. Machine translation became a lot more interesting to people. You know, in, the, in those early days, it was very obvious what was machine translated. The errors were laughable. Machine translation was a source of humor in many cases. But when we switched to the corpus-based and particularly uh, statistical machine translation, we did see a noticeable increase in the quality of the output. And machine translation became a little more viable to the translation profession. Maybe it became a little more threatening. Um, and so we kind of kept our eye on it. And it progressed and progressed and progressed for about 20 years. And then in just the last three years, in the end of 2016, so almost exactly three years ago, we saw another paradigm shift be introduced. Now we have, still in a kind of data-driven approach, we've uh, gone into the era of neural machine translation, where artificial intelligence techniques like machine learning are being used to kind of unleash a computer on um, a large, very, very large uh, training set of data and neural networks that are kind of finding their way through it, looking at, at, at examples and learning how to translate. And we've seen an even more sharp incline uh, up in terms of the quality of machine translation. So what went from being a kind of research interest, a source of humor, um, you know, kind of a problem, has become now a really viable option for translators and for non-translators to use as a kind of at least a stepping stone uh, on the way to getting a good translation. Okay, so it really is quite viable now. So we've seen for a long time machine translation was used for what we call gisting, just getting the general idea of what a text was about. Um, but now we're seeing that it's possible to take it a little bit further. Although it's still not perfect, um, maybe we'll see a point where uh, the, the kind of contribution of humans will change, not be part of the translation process per se. Well, I think we're seeing it already more in a, in a sort of editorial role. Um, but certainly at the moment, there's still a scope for people to have a, a sort of helping hand in this issue. But some of the challenges that we're facing at the moment are, you know, machine translation for many years was in the hands of either researchers or translation professionals, but now it's out in the wild, right? It's out there, it's free, it's online, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. So that's one challenge that we're facing. Another challenge that we're facing is that it's almost too easy to use. It's copy, paste, click. Right? The how to use this technology is not the problem. So when it's too easy to use, we kind of can use it in a very unthinking way, in a very automated kind of way. So that's another challenge. And something else that has come with neural machine translation, which was not so much an issue with the earlier approaches to machine translation, is that the, the translation or the, the text that's produced, rather, is very fluent. In, in the past, it was quite easy to recognize machine translation, right? Translationese, 
translation, machine translation systems made very predictable errors. Their output was very clunky. But now we're in a state where it reads very well. And because it reads so well, we're kind of lulled into a sense of security that it must be accurate. In fact, there have been some studies that show the machine translation text can read very well and not be a good translation of the text, of the source text at all. So these are just a few of the challenges that I've kind of been pondering and thinking about, wow, how, how are we going to deal with this? We're in a new era now. We can't recognize machine translation immediately the way we used to. We can use it without thinking at all, just click, 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 and we're done. And we're seeing more and more people who are not trained in the language professions, not trained in translation, are using this technology. So what does that, where does that leave us? And it got me thinking about this concept of literacy. And maybe this is, as uh, Anthony said, my, my kind of other life is, is in, in library and information science, where this concept of literacy is very, very important. And we have seen as our society evolves that you know, new literacies get introduced. There's a need for new types of literacy training as our society evolves. So the original literacy we think about is, you know, learning to read and write. Uh, we throw in arithmetic for those three R's there, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And that was the original sense of literacy. But as technology became more pervasive, we talk about computer literacy, right? Uh, as people take more and more responsibility for all aspects of their lives. We have financial literacy, health literacy. And the internet has kind of forced us to become uh, more active in, in many areas that we used to farm out to specialists. Uh, we talk about science literacy. We talk about media literacy, fake news. How are we going to kind of learn to cope with that? Information literacy. How are we managing to find credible information? How do we evaluate information? So there's all kinds of, of new literacies out there, including digital literacy. And it kind of got me thinking that perhaps what we're dealing with now is a need for a machine translation literacy, a kind of subtype of digital literacy. So that's sort of how I arrived at this topic. What I'm trying to do now is figure out how to take it forward. What does machine translation literacy look like? What types of information do we need to provide to users of machine translation tools? And on the one hand, we have um, kind of the translators and the, the people who are, are training to become translators. And then on the other hand, we have all those other users out there. So uh, we may need to handle them differently. And um, for the moment, my interest is in looking at those other users. Even though I am a translator trainer, I'm kind of curious about what non-translators are doing with the technology. And it seems to me that machine translation literacy is, is primarily a cognitive issue. It's not a, a kind of techno-procedural one. As I said, the technology is so easy to use. Some other types of technology are complicated. Trados is becoming more and more complicated by the minute. This is a, a tool, translation memory tool, that has so many bells and whistles on it that it's inordinately complicated to use. So there is a whole area of translator technology training with a tool like Trados that is about the how, how to use this tool because it's so complicated. We don't really have that issue with machine translation. What we really are thinking about in, in, in a context of machine translation literacy is whether we should use this tool. Is this the right application for this tool? Is this the right type of text for this tool? the right context. So should just because we can use it, should we use it? That's sort of one of the first questions that I think needs to be asked. When should we use it? When should we use machine translation versus when should we use another tool or no tool at all? Why are we picking machine translation? So they're really these kind of what I call, call more cognitive questions. It's not the how-to. It's not push this button, click that. It's, it's really more the kind of meta, thinking about uh, all, the, all the kind of issues around machine translation. What would be the implications of choosing to use this tool? And so my idea is that what we want, ideally, is to 
prepare people to be critical and informed users of the technology, not just kind of people who copy, paste, and click in a kind of automatic or unthinking way. Does that sound okay so far? Yeah? I'm convinced you? <laughs> All right, so in the, in the big picture, it seems, okay, fairly obvious. But the next question is, is sort of like, for me, almost an ethical one, a little bit. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is the relationship of translators to technology and the historical relationship of translators to technology. And it's been very contentious, right? Part of the challenge is that it was handled badly in the beginning. Machine translation was pitched from the get-go as this miracle technology that would replace translators. It would obviate the need for language professionals. Um, Anthony and I were talking just before coming in here about how some professions seem to have an expiry date on them. And back in the 1940s, translation had an expiry date. Machine translation was going to just you know, be the business. It was going to do all translation. So they oversold the product in the beginning and they definitely under-delivered with the first kind of generation of machine translation, those rule-based approaches. So translators were, first of all, um, first of all, they were left out of the conversation, right? The early machine translation uh, systems were developed uh, without consulting translators at all. It was very much a, an engineering and computing um, endeavor. So translators were first of all cut out of the discussion and then they were told that they were going to be replaced and then the product was actually very laughable so then it became a kind of like a source of derision. So all of the early kind of um, communication around machine translation was quite negative and at best translators saw it as a, a sort of humorous uh, joke and at worst they saw it as a threat to their profession. So, there was never a lot of love between translators and technology. The rhetoric switched a little bit when we began to talk about computer-aided translation rather than machine translation. So computer-aided translation intended to help and support the translator, um, often pitched as not doing the translation work itself, but helping with some of the supporting tasks around it. So uh, automating lookups, um, managing the consistency of terminology, uh, but not doing the translation. That rested with the, the translator and um, in Canada and also here in Australia. I know that it's a kind of uh, reserved title, translator, right? It's a, a, you've got a certification process around it. So translators, I think, became more comfortable with this idea that they would be in control and that the uh, technology would really be used as an aid or support around them. Well, this is beginning to change again. In the days when we had rule-based machine translation and even early statistical machine translation, there really was no contest in quality. Um, in fact, sometimes we saw machine translation as a good thing because it would take care of the text that we didn't want to translate ourselves. So one of the great success stories of machine translation uh, comes out of Canada, and it's the Meteo system. Are you familiar with that? It was a machine translation system that was developed uh, to translate weather forecasts. That's all it did. It translated weather forecasts for Environment Canada did it very well. You can imagine that weather forecasts are a sub-language, a very restricted uh, vocabulary, restricted grammar. So did a fantastic job because there wasn't really much to deal with. And also, thank goodness, who wants to translate weather forecasts for a living, right? They had the biggest turnover of any department in probably the entire federal government. Translators would go there for their first job out of university. They would stay for three, four months until they could find something else. That would just be like really how boring translating weather forecasts. So we were quite happy, in fact, to farm out some of the translation responsibility for things that we didn't want to do, leave the more interesting work for ourselves. So we kind of developed this sort of eventually, you know, going from feeling very threatened to machine translation to feeling like, well, technology can support us, uh, technology can take on some of the mundane work that we don't want to do. But now we're back in a, in a state where it is, as I said, sort of very viable for people to 
cut out translators again. So we've got this disintermediation happening where the, the middleman, the translator, is being kind of cut out of the equation again. The user is going straight to the translation tool and the, the language professional is left out. And so the initial reaction, certainly in Canada, um, maybe you can talk to me about the Australian situation, um, but also I know in some other parts of the world was for professional translators associations to get very um, stroppy, I would say, about technology. And the Canadian Translators and Interpreters Council had on their website for a very long time a very public denunciation of machine translation, telling people, do not use machine translation, you are foolish if you use machine translation, you are putting yourself at risk if you use machine translation, you know, always consult a professional, that's what we're here for, you get what you pay for, and, and it was a, a really uh, harsh kind of um, message against machine translation uh, from the Canadian Professional Translators Association. I think that's a little bit in Canada what, what the Translators Association was afraid of, that people wouldn't take the business to professional translators, that they would, this disintermediation would happen, that they would just um, unthinkingly use machine translation themselves. And because they probably were not fluent in the language that they were translating into, which is why they were hiring a translator, um, they wouldn't even be able to judge the quality of it. So there were some examples, and perhaps this is at the root of it, where um, a, you know, a municipal government in Western Canada used machine translation for their website because they thought it was well, you know, cheaper, it's a business decision, right? It doesn't cost anything and it's fast, super fast. I can get that information up on the web very quickly. Um, but it was a very poor quality and so uh, there was a backlash and so, yeah, I mean, I don't know, maybe in Canada it's extremely sensitive because we have two official languages so when this happens in an official language capacity, uh, it is a very sensitive issue. So this is happening now too in Canada. We've seen these um, kind of dismissive uh, messages have, have been removed from websites. And um, we're starting to have a discussion, but we're, I would say we're really only just starting to have a discussion about it now in the professional association kind of level um, about where does our responsibility lie as translators to help people outside the language professions become informed users of technology? And it's kind of, um, I guess it's kind of been proven that simply forbidding people from using machine translation is not going to work, right? Um, my kids are uh, at um, a type of school that, that we have, which is an uh, immersion school. So we're an Anglophone uh, speaking family, but we have the option to send our kids to school in French to kind of uh, learn that. And, you know, I was almost laughing when I saw this message coming home from the teacher on the first day. You know, it, it is not allowed to use Google Translate for your homework. You know, you do not. This is, is forbidden. And I thought, well, how are you going to police this, first of all? And is that the answer? You know, is forbidding, forbidding something ever the answer? It's out there, it's free, and people are using it. So where, and, and this is a genuine question, where does our responsibility lie as language professionals? Should we say, you know, no, don't, don't take the risk, you know, bring all of your business to us, <laughs> which has a kind of self-interest um, in it. And, and we know that we could do a better job, even if it's just, um, you know, kind of proofreading, verifying that the machine has, has translated it correctly. We know that we can uh, bring a value add, right? I don't think it's a question that we have nothing to add. But, you know, I also think about a lot of um, situations where I've done a lot of work with the public library, for example, and they just don't have an enormous budget. They cannot commit to having everything professionally translated or professionally edited or even proofread. So their choice is to use machine translation or to offer nothing. And so I think we're at a, at a point now where, as I said, the, this conversation wasn't even sort of permitted a few years ago. But now we're, we're starting to have a conversation. And um, again, it's really, in Canada anyway, we're just at, at the beginning, and I don't have an answer, but what is the responsibility of our profession to help people outside of it become literate in this technology? 
And there are a few kind of examples. Um, again, I, I often do refer to the library world because I know it a little bit better. Um, but there's a large project at the moment uh, going on in both the United States and Canada, which is called Artificial Intelligence for All, so AI for All. And the idea is that many, not just translation technology, but many types of technology now are, are linked to AI, and it's about educating people, helping them become informed users, helping them to be able to make decisions about whether or not to use the technology. What are some of the risks? What are some of the benefits? So this AI for all movement um, is taking place in connection with often with public libraries because um, this is a, a place where people do go for information. It's um, a place that's open to people regardless of their socioeconomic status, even if they're not you know, able to go and pay for uh, courses or be informed in other ways. And so I was very interested to see that UNESCO has um, organized a conference uh, for this coming December, so it hasn't happened yet, which they're calling LT for All, Language Technologies for All. And uh, a lot of it has been inspired by, um, I think, the migration uh, kind of crisis that's happening in Europe right now, um, where there are many refugees, and you know, how can we use language technologies in situations that we hadn't thought of using them before, and particularly in situations where people are not in a position to pay for professional translation. They're going to use this technology, so should we be helping them use it in a smart way? Now, I'm going to share with you a little bit. Um, so this is a very new project. It kind of launched in uh, September. We're in October now, so I don't have lots of data. But I've uh, started uh, working on this idea of machine translation literacy. And for, for the first case, I have been working with international students at um, uh, two different universities in Canada. So we have seen uh, quite clearly over the past 50 years that the language of scholarly communication, particularly publishing, so we're, we're all here in an academic environment, um, we want to publish work, uh, the language of communication in the scholarly publishing context has become English. So it doesn't matter particularly that it's English, but it's the fact that it's a lingua franca, so we're all having working towards uh, communicating in one language. At the same time, uh, certainly in Canada, and I'll welcome your uh, thoughts on this, uh, internationalization is a big thing now in universities in Canada, uh, where we are trying to diversify our student bodies, we're very open and welcoming, and in fact, sometimes aggressively hunting for international students to come to our home universities. And while it does bring a richness of diversity, it, it also means that uh, we have uh, a lot more people who are arriving in Canada having to communicate in English and are you know, uh, having uh, different types of challenges. So we've got, um, uh, that's our situation in Canada where English is an official language. We're also seeing, uh, particularly in Europe, but maybe in other places too, that many, um, universities in countries where English is not an official language are nonetheless choosing to offer their courses through the medium of English. So this is happening. So uh, for, for many different reasons and, and motivations, we we arrive at a place where we all need to speak English or publish in English in this academic uh, context. So I thought, great, this is an opportunity to test out some stuff on machine translation. So. Uh, yeah, this is pretty much what I just said. Um, it's, it's not uh, even a nice to have for many people. It's a need to have. There are universities, uh, particularly in Mexico is one example. India is another example where in order to get your PhD, you need a requirement for the degree to be granted to you is that you have to have published at least one article in uh, you know, from a particular basket of journals in a, in a top-ranked international journal. Well, those journals are all English, speak, English language journals. If you are successful in getting your degree, you need to probably publish more in those top-ranked journals to get hired. Once you've got your first contract, it's not over. You've got to keep publishing to get tenure, to get promotion. 
uh, to get grants, to get funds, to get citations. The institution wants you to publish to boost the institutional impact factor or ranking. So it just, it never ends. The pressure to publish in English is enormous. And the injustice of it is that you know, uh, native English speakers like me, we are in such a, a position of luxury. Why should someone be uh, a top physicist and fluent in English? You know, why should someone be a, a medical researcher who is also, you know, publishing in international journals in English? So we have a situation where about 10% of active researchers are native speakers of English, and about 90% of the publication that happens happens in English. So it's a very unfair, very unlevel playing field at the moment. So we're not going to, I think, you know, we can argue about whether or not it's right that English is a lingua franca, um, what, you know, other things we could do, but I think none of us here in this room as individuals are going to change that. Maybe what we could do is help people, um, you know, trying to level the playing field, probably not completely, but even just give them a, a little boost. At the moment, the options, and I'm, I do probably don't need to, to share this with you, but I'll go over it quickly. What can uh, non-Anglophone researchers do at the moment? Well, they can publish in other languages, of course. There are national journals, but they're getting to be few and far between journals that publish in other languages. Um, the drawback is that the work might not be read as widely, it might not support career advancement, your institution may not be happy with you only publishing in national journals. Uh, you could choose to publish in less prestigious journals, so not the top ranked ones, maybe the uh, lower ranked journals have a lower bar for uh, linguistic quality, so possibly uh, you could try to publish there, but again, it's not going to mesh with those uh, goals of getting tenure or getting funding. Uh, there's also a risk that some of those journals that seem to be less picky, they may not even be legitimate journals, right? There's uh, predatory publishing is something that's becoming a big issue now. We can encourage them to learn English, and I, it, I think Everyone's working on that, right? But that's not a quick fix. Learning a language, as we all know, people in this profession, learning any language to a high level is a long-term investment. So great, we can work on that, but in the meantime, is there anything else we can do? We could hire a professional translator. That would make all of the translators happy, for sure, but you're looking at probably a thousand bucks per article to get that professionally translated. And the more specialized you get, and you do get pretty specialized when you're a top level researcher, um, there aren't so many translators who are capable of taking on that subject matter, right? So you're, you're really paying a premium because their job is very difficult as a translator dealing with that cutting edge material. So again, um, it's unfortunate, but the people who are often in the most need of professional translators are people from non-Anglophone countries. Many of them are in the developing world, so their budgets are lower, and it's a kind of a vicious cycle, right? So hiring a professional translator is not always an option. Same with hiring an editor. It might be a little bit cheaper to hire an editor, but you then need to give them a very good draft to begin with. Right? We can collaborate, and that's a, a great idea, and, and many of us do uh, have teams, and there could be someone on the team who's stronger in English, and that could be helpful. What you don't want to do is find yourself in a situation where you're collaborating with people only because you want them to fix up the English, and they're taking authorship from you, and it's, they're your ideas, and things like that. So that can work sometimes, but not always. Um, using amateur translators. Uh, they have these very interesting sites which I've been introduced to, things like um, gig workers. Uh, so it's, one of them is actually called Gig Bucks, and they'll post jobs, and people put really interesting things up there, like, I'll translate a thousand words for five bucks. And it's like, oh, okay. Um, so there were a couple of translators in the UK who did a sort of mystery shopper experiment with a couple of these gig sites. And what they found was that the translations that they were getting back for their five bucks 
were a Google Translate, like word for word. Like the person just took the, the text, ran it through Google Translate, sent it back, and made five bucks. So if, if that's all that's gonna happen, five bucks isn't very much, but you know, why even spend the five bucks if all they're gonna do is run it through Google Translate? It was a really interesting uh, little experiment that they recorded on. Um, so, if, so if essentially uh, we're, we're coming down to you know, things that are not too expensive, things where the quality is, is you know, kind of man manageable, uh, we're arriving again at a state where machine translation was not a viable option in the past. It, the quality really was too poor. But now, maybe we're in a, in a state where machine translation can be part of the solution, again. Not necessarily the whole solution, but maybe part of it, right? But if we want to think about using machine translation, are there things that we need to be aware of? Are there, is there information we can share with these people that seems obvious to us in the language professions, right? But, but remember, we're, we're steeped in this world of translation. These are people who are physicists, who are working in law, business, researchers in all kinds of other fields, not languages. So some of the things that we take for granted might be new to them. So that was my idea. What could a machine translation literacy workshop look like for people who don't have a background in translation? So I'm gonna share with you some of the things that I've come up with so far. Some of them are common sense. Some of them are new to the people who are hearing it because they're not people from a translation background. Maybe you'll have things to add or maybe you'll tell me these don't seem worth sharing, and that's fair enough. So some of the things that I would like to impress upon people, and for the moment I say I'm working primarily with international students, at all levels, I initially was thinking that it would be more interesting for graduate students, but quite a few undergrad students showed up to the workshop, which I wasn't necessarily prepared for, and I have realized since that we may need to customize different workshops for those two different groups, but I, I welcomed everyone for, for the, the first pilot, and, uh, and it was a, an interesting learning experience. So some of the things that I want them to take away are, first of all, that translation is not one thing, right? Every task is different. Some are high risk, some are low risk, some uh, you know, really require speed, others would benefit more from quality. So translation is not just one thing. So when you think about whether you should use machine translation, you have to think about that every single time. Is machine translation the right choice for this task? Well, that's what I mean for, and, and in, the, in the scholarly communication context, even within that fairly narrow context, there are some jobs that machine translation might be more sensible for and others for which it might be a uh, less good choice. Questions of privacy and confidentiality come up because we're dealing with free online machine translation in most cases. The question of academic integrity comes up. This question of machine bias or algorithmic bias, not something that your average person necessarily thinks about. And of course, the, I'm kind of simplifying it a little bit, but this idea of garbage in, garbage out. So these are, are kind of the five things that I've uh, sort of taken as Okay, maybe as, a, as an initial sharing of uh, what machine translation literacy might look like, these are, are the things that I'm uh, trying to get people to consider. Okay, so the first one, this idea that machine translation and translation in general is not just one thing, I really want um, the students to think about the fact that, again, even in this narrow, narrowly defined world of scholarly communication, we can identify different tasks. So one of the things that people uh, do at the beginning of a research project is what we call discovery, searching for what's already been said on this topic, right? All research projects start with that, with a literature survey. So when you go into a search engine or into a library uh, catalog tool, um, you're going to be typing keywords. Is machine translation a good choice for translating keywords? Possibly not. Certainly in the old and older style of machine translation systems, it would not have been a good choice because um, 
When things don't have context, the machine has nothing on which to base its decision. And to be fair, that's how we operate too, right? Like if I said to, well, I always think of French because that's uh, our other language in um, Canada. But if I said to you, what is the translation for avocat? What is the translation for avocat? Would you know? Would you be able to tell me definitively what is the translation for avocat? Because on the one hand, it could be lawyer. On the other hand, it could be avocado. Right? That, that single word means both of those things. Both are viable and le legitimate translations. Without any context, we don't know, and certainly a machine doesn't know. So using machine translation for keyword translation is not always the most sensible. It's only when we put it in a larger context, a sentence, a paragraph, a text, that words take on meaning. So that's one task for which I would say machine translation is not very sensible. Uh, once we have found our literature, the next step in research, though, is reading that literature. Here's a, a place where machine translation has a long history of success, gisting. Particularly for people who are experts in the field, right? You know the field very well. You can fill in the blanks. If it's not so elegant, you're able to kind of patch it up. So assimilating a text or reading for your own personal information tends to be a good use of machine translation. Okay. Part of your research project, we're often working in groups on research teams, uh, so part of it might be communicating with colleagues. Here again, I would say this is a case where uh, we have different types of tolerance for different texts. An email, we're pretty tolerant if the, if the email isn't perfect, right? If it's got spelling mistakes, punctuation mistakes, so people are usually, on the whole, not so picky about email, as long as they can understand the content. So things that are very content-driven rather than style-driven, things where the stakes are low, things where you have the opportunity to clarify, those, to me, all seem like reasonable uses of machine translation. Then we get to the disseminating a published article, which has a very long lifespan, and where, unfortunately, those gatekeepers, those editors of the English language journals, the peer reviewers, can be really brutal. They really can. And so this is a, a different type of tolerance. This is where people typically, though, would like machine translation to be able to help them. So we're going to look at some sort of potential ways of trying to help people make better use of machine translation. Okay. But again, the point that I, I really want, not necessarily you guys, but people at these workshops to take away is that think about the task. Think about whether machine translation is the right tool for the task. Because even scholarly communication is not just one thing. Here's the answer to Anthony's question. Pay attention, Anthony. What happens to my text when I type it into Google Translate? When I close the window, does the text go away? No. Spoiler alert. Google grabs your text and keeps it and has in their policy, terms of service, a statement that we all agree, we just accept these terms of service without even reading them for everything because first of all, they're 40 pages long and what are you gonna do anyway? What are, what are your alternative choices? So we, we tend not to pay a lot of attention to uh, Google's terms of service, but Google, and Google, I'm picking on Google, but they're just one example. All of the, all of the machine uh, translation, free online machine translation systems do this. They take your data and they use it as part of, you know, of their training data for the next iterations of the machine or for anything that they want, but typically it's, it's for training. So if you're doing research that's very sensitive or if you're using machine translation for other types of texts, um, not just your research texts, like think twice before putting anything private or confidential into a, an online, free online machine translation system. Um, you know, some research is quite concerned with intellectual property, uh, patent pending type stuff. 
So uh, if that's the sort of work that you're doing, um, you know, just be, be informed. Take the necessary precautions because the text doesn't just disappear when you close the window. It goes into Google's hands and they have pretty much a carte blanche to do what they want with it. This turned out to be something that I hadn't really considered and I said initially I was pitching this more to grad students and, and people who are um, established researchers but many um, undergraduate students came to the workshop and so did some staff from the Academic Writing Help Center and they were very um, uh, kind of helpful in informing me that some of the undergrad students were under the impression that plagiarism only applied to words and not kind of thoughts and concepts. And so they were taking things from one language, putting it through the machine translation system, and all of a sudden the words were different, so they didn't need to attribute the, the sources. So again, depending on the level of, of people and the background uh, that they have, this was an issue that uh, sort of came up of, I say, particularly for some of the undergrad students, that they need, needed to be kind of informed that just because you run it through a machine translation system doesn't mean you're no longer required to attribute sources and do proper referencing to the ideas that have come from another text. Okay. This question of, of uh, sometimes it's called machine bias or algorithmic bias, um, is really a sort of phenomenon that has come with this neural uh, approach to machine translation. Not, it's not only machine translation, but any type of machine learning, um, where the texts or the, the systems learn based on the text that they've been trained on. So uh, again, in, in machine translation, this uh, has, has a number of different implications. If a system has been trained on medical texts, it probably won't be good for translating legal texts. If it's been trained on um, kind of texts that are contracts, very formulaic, it probably won't be good for translating uh, types of texts that are a little more freehand. Now with the big online free machine translation systems, we don't really know what they've been trained on. Uh, it's probably a bit of everything, so they're what we call try anything systems. Um, but one uh, particular uh, kind of type of, of machine bias uh, was revealed in Google Translate uh, at the end of last year. And that was the fact that it was kind of producing a little bit of sexist language. It was um, perpetuating this idea that certain professions were more uh, for men and other professions were more for women, and they kind of got a public hand slap for that. And so now they're aware of this problem and they're trying to fix it. Um, so this is just one example, uh, but it's really, again, just to plant that seed of awareness that the machine will learn what we teach it, and if we don't teach it well, then it may not be learning well. And since we have no control over what it's being taught, it is in our best interests to double check the output and make sure that that output is reflective of what we would like the text to, to say at the end of the day, right? So again, it's this sort of value add, this responsibility of, of uh, the person at the end of the day to make sure that the text, the target text, is a text that we want to stand over and maybe not one that necessarily reflects any bias that might have been in the machine translation's training data. Any comments? Sorry, people are getting tired and hungry probably. Um, on, the, on that note, uh, I would like to say that there are other systems out there beyond Google. Everyone thinks of Google Translate, everyone goes to Google Translate, but there are actually many systems out there. These systems have probably all been trained on different data, so they may produce different results. So one of the things that I would say to students is, if you don't like the results that you get from Google, try another system. <laughs> Some of them are better for certain language combinations. Um, you know, not all of them do all language combinations. One of the reasons Google is popular is because it does a very diverse range of languages, and it is actually, for, for many of those languages, it, it is quite good. But there could be other languages for which uh, another system is better. One of my favorites, because I work primarily with French and English, a bit of Spanish, I actually find that DeepL does a better job than Google for the language pairs that I work with. 
But my point is there's more out there than just Google, so don't be afraid. If you don't like what you get, try a different one. And also, keep in mind that they're constantly learning. So if you don't like what you get this week, don't write off that system forever because it's being fed. So learning more. Exactly. Can try it again next week, you might find out that it's better already. So again, just to say that machine translation is not a sort of steady state of system. These systems are constantly, constantly being tweaked. So um, this is a bit like uh, what Anthony told me uh, on the way up here about weather in Melbourne, right? <laughs> if you don't like the weather, wait a few hours and maybe you'll have something different. Same with this machine translation. And again, this is not, I think, for us uh, anything new, but for people who are not familiar with machine translation, the idea that you can improve the output by changing the input is something that doesn't necessarily occur to people. And if you think about the, again, the group that I'm working with here, they are primarily international students, um, maybe having to hand in work to a professor in English. What they're doing is often, and you know, um, my kids are doing this too, they'll, they'll write uh, the text in their uh, dominant language, they'll feed it through a machine translation system, and then they'll try to fix up the English that comes out. But of course, English is not their dominant language. And we all know it's much harder to work on a text in a non-native language, whereas you actually might have a better shot of tweaking the text that you've written in your dominant language, simplifying it. And particularly, I would say, like, all languages are different, so I can't you know, specifically say, like, don't use complex compound pre-modifiers. That doesn't apply to all languages. But this idea of plain language does exist for all languages. Mm -hmm. Garbage in, garbage out. It might not be garbage that you're putting in, but the more complex, the more ambiguous things that you put into a machine translation system, the worse the output will be. So try to simplify the structures of your text. It doesn't mean dumb down the content, but just the structures. Use short sentences. Um, you know, if, there, if you have a choice between a complex way of saying something and a straightforward way of saying something, choose the straightforward way. Be consistent with your terminology. All of these things that we kind of think of as good writing, because we're in the language professions, other people don't necessarily think of these. So uh, it's sort of enlightening to them to think about how a good way to improve the output is to change the input. So I've... Um, uh, yeah, the, the specifics, though, will obviously change from one language to the next. Uh, whoops, I'm backwards here. So I have already piloted this twice, um, just in September. So as I said, I don't really have a, uh, a lot of results. I've had a total of 30 participants from two different universities. I had very mixed groups of people coming out uh, fr from undergraduates uh, through graduates, uh, faculty researchers, and staff from this Academic Writing Help Center. And I've realized they are interested in different things. So probably, a, again, a one-size-fits-all workshop was not a good idea. Probably better to customize it out in the future. Um, in particular, people were very interested in machine translation as a writing aid. That was their primary goal in coming to the workshop was to get help with writing in English. So some of the other things um, were of less interest to them. Um, and, and they were really looking, they were hungry for very specific tips. How can I make the text better, whether it's at a pre-editing or a post-editing stage? So again, this is a challenge if you're trying to offer a gen generic workshop because so many of the tips and tricks are language dependent, um, but it has just uh, kind of made me realize I need to expand my team of people that I'm working with uh, to include a much broader range of languages. In general, though, it was sort of, I, I felt well received. I did do a survey after the workshop and I, I got some uh, interesting feedback. Everyone said that they did learn something new, so it wasn't old hat to them. Um, some learned more than others, but everyone learned at least something new. Most did say they would recommend it to a friend, and uh, a, a half of them said that they would come back 
if uh, we were to develop a more advanced follow-up workshop, uh, particularly a little more customized to uh, maybe a specific language pair, um, very practical, concrete tips. So in general, my first um, experience with it was that it was relatively well received, um, but obviously there are some improvements to be made. And thinking uh, about what's next, well obviously I still have more work to do on that, but I've um, already been talking, and again, I have a, always a very library mindset just because of, uh, of my other world there, um, that this is something that could be interesting uh, with school libraries based on the experience that I had with my own kids and their teachers forbidding it, which is not a helpful strategy. Um, but also with public libraries, uh, particularly for newcomers, immigrants, uh, people who are coming uh, with different language backgrounds uh, that are not um, uh, one of Canada's official languages. So uh, there's a little bit of interest uh, with the public library as well. No resources, of course, that's not the problem working in the public library. But um, those are other groups that I think might benefit from uh, variations of uh, machine translation literacy training. 